Welcome everyone to the Center for Global Development. I'm Amanda Glassman. I'm a senior fellow here. Since its founding, um, the Center for Global Development has been deeply engaged in the way that the international financial institutions and related multilaterals treat the issues of debt and aid and revenues and fiscal space in low and middle income countries and how this affects development prospects, particularly in health and more recently in education. In 2007, CGD fellows in a working group looked at whether and how IMF programs affected spend on health. Short answer, not that much. Uh, returned to the issue in 2011 with a note and more recently our colleague Sanjeev Gupta has been looking at the effectiveness of expenditure conditionality in IMF programs. Short answer, not much. Uh, growth matters more. Um, so we've long been interested in this issue of how the IMF is interacting with uh, social spending. But whether a period of expansion or framed by the Sustainable Development Goal agenda or whether a period of adjustment, uh, which is possible given le rising levels of debt service, um, and stagnation in growth in some places, um, the, the role of the IMF and its partner institutions like the World Bank, as well as organizations like UNICEF, which we're joined at today, have a lot to say about how this all works, how much we can continue to deliver on development prospects given the inevitable ups and downs in terms of fiscal space. Today we do not have a country client of the IMF joining us today. I think that's okay because we're actually speaking to ourselves at this time. We're learning what's there, um, but I definitely think we should, round, we should meet again uh, to discuss what this means with policymakers who are really grappling with these issues and, and, and facing the IMF and the World Bank and others on the other side of the table. So we'll kick off with an overview of a new strategy that the IMF has launched on engagement in social spending. David Cody will join us. He's the head of the, I'm going to get your expenditure policy division of the Fiscal Affairs Department of the IMF. Um, and he'll talk about the key fiscal and financing challenges that are being faced by low-income countries as they aspire to make progress against the SDGs and what the IMF space in the interaction of those issues uh, looks like. And we'll focus the panel after the overview on how does the new strategy anticipate changing the way that spending envelopes are defined and if needed adjustment occurs under an IMF program? What is the relative role that they see for themselves versus other agencies? And then what comes next? Some guidelines are on the table. Uh, how will different organizations be engaged in this process? So first we'll turn it over to David who will speak for 15 minutes and we'll go to our panel after that. Thanks. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Uh, I'd first like to start by thanking CGD for the opportunity to have a discussion around our, board, our strat new strategy. Um, I'd also like to thank you guys for turning up on a Friday lunchtime, but you did get a free lunch, I guess, so, but there is no free lunch, and I'm about to prove that to you. Uh, you've got to sit through this. But also, I think this has been streamed somewhere. So to you guys out there, thank you very much. Similarly, you didn't get the free lunch, but thank you for joining. I hope there's somebody there. Um, so what I let me make sure I get this going. So what I want to do in the presentation is to set the scene for the discussion. I got 15 minutes. I'm going to stick to it because some very tight schedule keepers are here. Um, so what do I want to do? I want to set the scene for a discussion for the strategy and beyond the strategy. And when I mean not just beyond what we're doing, but beyond where, we're, where does this all go? And I'll start by describing why we thought we need a strategy, then a bit about what, how we talk to our staff now about when and how we engage, especially including in the context of programs, which is nearly often always the discussion in a lot of these meetings. But then I want to come out of that and try and map ourselves bigger to the bigger agenda of the SDGs because I think that's really important going forward and where this and other things have to come together. Um, and the issue of financing the SDGs based on recent work. Uh, a key issue is going to be about the need for really strong partnerships. And I'll say what I mean by that. Um, 
going forward. Okay. So why do we need a strategy? Uh, first of all, I'd like to make the point, we don't need a strategy because we're planning to do a major scaling up of social spending engagement. We need a strategy because we've already scaled up our engagement in the fund. And this is at the core of why we needed this, and this was recognized by the IAO report, that we needed to, now I have clicks here, which I guess I can't do. It's very dangerous to do. Um, I'm gonna, can I go backwards as well? I can. So I'm gonna jump ahead here and then go back. No, I'm not. This was not a good idea. Uh, how do I get help? Okay, I'm going to keep talking because I got 15 minutes, but if someone can sort that out, it'd be good. Uh, uh, there is someone taking care of us. So I'm not going to try and I, I was linking to a slide there and the slide will be available, I'm sure, when you have it. We kind of knew this already that we ha were heavily engaged in social, as we increased our engagement on inclusive growth in the fund. So in my time there, I've definitely seen a ratcheting up of engagement on social spending issues in that context. So we did various things to support that in the, in the, in, in the board paper. Now at the end, you can get all the links, some background papers and everything. I encourage you to look at those. There's some interesting background papers as well on specific issues. And one is a mission chief survey, where mission chiefs are guys who look after our country work in the countries and organize that. We asked the mission chief survey, do you think across all the fund, do you think social spending is macro-critical? Macro-critical in the fund, as I began to learn very much in the last year or two, means that it has the potential, it does or has the potential to affect domestic external stability or is important for promoting sustained inclusive growth. Okay, the last second part is something that's been emphasized more over the last, say, decade. So about 73 quarters of mission chiefs said it was macro-critical. And when we said, did you give policy advice? The same thing, about 70, 80% varied across, said they were giving some policy advice or advice before in this area. So clearly, it's, it's really scaled up. And this is why we needed a study. So it's not that it's a new strategy because there was no old strategy. It's a strategy to guide that engagement, which is fairly new, if we talk about decades, uh, in, in the fund. But it's, it's because of the scaling up. We need it, but we want to do two things, to set the scope of what we do, but also the boundaries. I'll talk about that as I go along. And that's really important to our own staff as well, and to basically how we need to engage uh, or collaborate together. Uh, key at the background here is to make sure that when we're giving any policy advice, that it's consistent and even-handed and consistent with our expertise. Okay, so this slide just reminds me, we had to skip one. So this is at the core, this macro criticality concept. My own view is that macro, we've ticked off the box that it is nearly, is nearly always macro critical <laughs> or will become uh, in some dimension of social spending, yeah? So, the three channels, which reflect, if we looked at what the mission chief survey said, it says there are three areas in which mission chief saw it was macro-critical. One is spending adequacy. You know, well, they didn't use that term, but they used the term gaps, social gaps, education gaps, health gaps, that the authorities wanted to address and wanted policies consistent with addressing that. That would clearly was a bigger issue in low income countries. Others were spending pressures or spending efficiency. Yeah? Bigger issue in advanced countries. So all makes a lot of sense. Yeah? Others were things like concern for the distributional or political stability in the country. And so distributional issues were quite important. So this came out very clear in the Mission Chief Survey. And there's a specific background paper on the Mission Chief Survey, which is quite interesting, I think. And this is the framework which we think maps to that as well. That typically the fund enters through fiscal sustainability. That's the, that's the core world of the fund. But what we found as we got involved with the issue of inclusive growth, we got 
pulled into a discussion, as you would expect, into spending adequacy and spending efficiency. And we started getting involved in giving policy advice in, in that world. And that's perfectly correct to do. But down here is where we need to understand boundaries as well. What type of advice do you look at to the fund? Yeah, and I'm going to argue you don't look to the fund to say, you guys have a primary healthcare system that's not interacting really well with your hospital system. You don't look to the fund for that type of advice. What we say to our country teams now is, this is perfectly correct for you to be involved in. And you have to engage in some way and be part of these discussions because that is what development is about. But your world is not that detailed sectoral work, but to bring us back to the fiscal sustainability. How do you create a fiscal framework consistent with addressing these policy issues? And I believe that's what the world wants us to do. Yeah? Now, we also talk about communication. And we worked very, we worked very, as part of this, we had extensive internal converse, consultation, which is really important, but also external consultation throughout the whole process with development partners, but also we had a specific consultative group made up of a fairly broad group of people who we had continuous engagement with, with different drafts and so on. So we made a huge effort to make sure that we were consulting on this. Yeah? Um, and we also tell our teams now that when you communicate on these issues, you should communicate clearly on where you're coming from, why we're looking at this, and not communicate on very narrow things in which you we really might not have expertise, but to anchor your discussion in what is our mandate and what is our role in, this, in these policy challenges. So where does that leave us? Where it doesn't leave us is where we say, sorry, uh, we don't want to talk about social safety nets, go to the World Bank or UNICEF or whoever. That's not an adequate outcome. We have to have a framework in which we have stronger partnerships with those who have the experts. And we've been working very strongly on this over the years. We've definitely escalated it beyond our usual culprits, uh, as we've been told, rightly so, that we had a fairly narrow uh, consult consultation in terms of develop even development partners, never mind broader stakeholder groups. So we have in common this. If I look at, say, the education stuff in the bank or the health stuff of the bank or whatever, any of the other organizations, they're invariably talking about these things. And very often you see bullets with exactly these terms on it. So this framework is common to all of us. I don't see anything that's not common. But we come at it top down, and we stop before we get into the sectoral detail. Development organizations come at it from the bottom up, and we meet, but we meet when we reach the common challenge of financing. This is really where the rubber hits the road, and where if anything is gonna change, we have to strengthen the way we collaborate at this dimension. Teams are expected to engage on social spending in a program context. This is a requirement because of the very nature of PRGT, poverty, uh, where are we? P poverty Reduction and Growth Trust. This is the objective of the trust. Of, the, of these programs. So in those programs, you're expected to engage in, in um, social spending. And you're expected to protect social spending at an existing level. And where feasible, and where you can develop it, you're expected to also be part of a dialogue for expanding spending in this area. Okay, so that's, that's when, this is not a new policy or anything. This was always there. We need to make sure it's applied consistently and effectively. Really a big part of what the strategy about is that. Even in GRA programs, they should look at the issue of social spending. Now in PRGT programs, there's usually an expectation that there's some form of conditionality, social spending floors, for example, uh, that goes along with those programs. And we're monitoring this very carefully now. Uh, we can come back to the issue of statements like, does the IMF, do IMF programs uh, protect social spending or does, do they decrease spending? To me, that's not an adequate enough question. There are studies that show that spending on average has been, nearly all come out with spending on average has been 
protected, which in a regression framework means compared to other countries that look like you type of thing. But there's a whole distribution around there of which many of them are negative. We show that in the, in the board paper. There are negatives there and we need to understand those better. There may be some good reasons for the negatives. For example, if GDP goes way up, it's unlikely the spending is going to be scaled up at that scale. So there's some kind of mechanical and other reasons, but we need to get to the bottom of that. So I think that's an area we want to be looking at much more carefully and understanding through our review process in particular. So program conditionality, there's stuff that you can use, the indicative targets and so on, uh, but also structural benchmarks. And I want to put out a, a push for the structural benchmarks because often stru structural benchmarks, are, there's no safety nets in many, no reasonable safety nets in many low-income countries. We have to be part of the discussion which says we, we want to see you develop a strategy for developing safety nets or stronger social spending systems. That can be done through structural benchmarks but requires heavy engagement with our development partners who have the expertise in these areas. So I wanted to move back out a little bit now and move outside of the strategy and talk about efforts we're making to map ourselves to the broader SDG agenda, development agenda. Here is work we've done over a year or so where we had some external stimulus to get involved in this from us. It's people saying this is an area you have to and should be working on, coming through the UN essentially. So we started looking at what is the cost of meeting the SDGs in areas we thought we could manage in a short space of time. So if the things that are left out here doesn't mean we don't think they're important. It means we had to do something in a short space of time. Uh, map it to ourselves as much as possible. The word investment immediately comes to my mind when I think of the fund. Yeah. Uh, so we looked at what ex what's the extra cost? How much more spending do you need, total spending do you need on education, health, and selected infrastructure, which was water, electricity, and roads. And we made what I would see as a very reasonable attempt at costing those. And of course, there's a secondary issue that comes out here is realism in the public debate about what's, what's the challenge here, the size of the challenge. I'm gonna focus in on low-income developing countries, which is the stark number, or the stark numbers. On average, they need six, to be spending 16 percentage points of GDP more in 2030 than they're doing on average now. So let's now put that in perspective. Here's distributions of tax capacity. So tax capacity, and I'm just going to zone in on low-income countries, median of 15 percentage point. So we're saying double the median. So message there, increasing tax capacity has to be a big part of this. And that will require not just changing tax rates, but really significant investment in revenue systems, but also in spending systems to make sure the money is well spent, okay? Again, a bit of realism, numbers you get seen pushed around is raising tax capacity, tax to GDP ratio by five percentage points in seven to 10 years is seen as feasible but extremely ambitious. So there, that's where we are with that. Um, we can talk about lower hanging fruit out there of which I think there are stuff but they require a broader engagement uh, with governments and societies in terms of what we're doing with those reforms. So where does that leave us? It leaves us with a big gap. Uh, this is just to put it global. We say if we, this is based on that 5%, okay? If you get the 5%, you get what's equivalent to a number which is about 0.3% of a percentage point of global GDP. It's worth noting, I think I've seen a number which says, for example, I'm gonna get some of this wrong, but if you, were to get countries to meet their 0.7% targets for aid. And if you were to do some reallocation towards, say, lower income, so both of those, which are challenges, you might get to what the licks need. But you'd have to be something on that scale. Yeah? So there are other things, but it says that two things, that 
external financing is really important in this, and that dialogue has to continue, especially if we think of 2030 as being the target. But it also brings up the issue of the private sector. And this, to me, is becoming a contentious debate among a lot of people, what's the role of the private sector? And I think it's something we're beginning to switch our attention to in terms of what do we mean by that, the private sector, and in what areas does it make sense? But again, other, other partners have really strong expertise in things like infrastructure and education and health or whatever. Now, I'm moving out to the SDGs here. Remember, uh, we haven't included other stuff in the SDGs here. Uh, climate, which might have overlaps. Uh, social protection is not there. Yeah? So we're being conservative with our, our scale uh, story. So it's really important that we keep these SDG agenda in mind when we're talking about social spending as well. We're, you had the Addis Ababa and you had a commitment to the SDGs and I'm going to get my names right when I say them the first time. In 2015, you had the Addis Ababa Action Agenda. In 2019, you had the Interagency Task Force Report. Yeah, just come out. Which sets up the building blocks for achieving that agenda. Okay? Or it sets up a framework. Remember, it's, it's a framework still. Yeah? Um, so, I think at the fund, we're committed to supporting that framework. But that framework, so you now have, for example, coming out of the, uh, after, the inter after uh, that report, you have something that's called the integrated, they call for integrated national financing frameworks. And the idea that countries have to start scaling up their capacity to do these things. Now, financing frameworks are both sides of the equation, and not just policies, but institutions and so on. So, what we are, I think at the fund, we, there's different ways we can do it. We can do it through surveillance, we can do it through lending and CD activities. A big part is about mobilizing alternative financing mechanism within a program context. That's one of the roles of the fund. Yeah? And a key role, if any of this is really going to happen, I think. So here, all I wanted to do is say, as from FAD perspective, that's, I'm, a, I'm in the fiscal affairs department. We are ready, and we're trying to make this explicit and improve it, or in our technical assistance, we give technical assistance to over 190 countries every year in revenue management, public financial management, uh, tax policy, expenditure policy, uh, broader fiscal rules and stuff like that. It's really extensive yeah? uh, and has been that way for a long time now. Here I'm just saying that we have a lot of stuff uh, so ignoring just the technical capacity, but we use these in our technical assistance. A lot of tools that are already there and being put in countries, which really is, are needed to support that integrated national financing frameworks. So what I want to do was leave you with this, is that the strategy is really about getting what we are doing to do it a lot better. But it's not just about the scope, but the boundaries of what we are, are trying to do. It's important that all of this moves to something like the bigger agenda picture of the SDGs, which to me is a very useful framework for rallying us together. You know, these type of agendas, you know, they put something in front of us to measure ourselves against. But hopefully put something in front of us to that says, listen, we're not going to get much here unless we have much stronger partnerships. And the partnerships I'm talking about are partnerships for helping countries do things, so, but also within government. And I see this a lot. Is within government, you need a stronger cross-government consensus on what you're trying to do. You know, I often say, no one should start any development or any fiscal discussion in a country with saying, we need to increase the VAT. Hands up, who wants that? Yeah. That's not the discussion. The discussion is, in our context, there are big social gaps that we need to fill in these countries. This is what development is. We need to finance them. But again and again, I see the discussion starting on the tax side. So my tax colleagues will probably get upset with me for that. You know? 
it has to start on the spending side. The biggest champions of increasing the VAT, energy subsidy reform, and there are things out there that can raise the money, should be the health ministry, the education ministry, the social protection ministry. And they should be combined with social groups, CSOs, who are interested in health and education and whatever. But how many times do we see that coalition effectively put together? Now to do that, I think we have these wonderful meetings, and I, I spent a lot of time in the bank and the fund and in Geneva, and we talk about similar things. It has to go to the country level. So I think what we're going to see with the EU and uh, UN impetus through the INFF, which is moving to the country level, we're going to see an increase in demand in the fund, for example, for our teams to become very actively engaged in that. But I think it's going to come to all of us. And I think it has to happen there. We know enough. I think it's about how we're doing it that matters now. You know, we can, we can stop writing some of our papers about, do we know enough? We know enough, yeah? So I think that impetus that's coming through the area departments, or the area departments, coming through the countries, is really where we have to start engaging. We do it at headquarters too, but in the fund what we're trying to do is build up a relationship. We've talked to UN UNICEF, we're talking to the different parts of the bank and the human capital group who's represented uh, here as well, to say, let's start making the link between our teams at the country level to make sure that they engage. We can have a role in that inside our institutions and across with each other making it happen, but it has to happen a lot better than it's happening. Okay, so that's really, I like, how am I doing? Perfectly fine, okay. Down. Okay, come on down, come on up, come on over. Sorry. <laughs> okay, thanks very much, David, for, for that overview of the strategy. I think, um, so we're joined today by uh, Hannah Brixey, who's the manager for the Human Capital Project at the World Bank, seating, seated to the left of David. And then Alexandra Euster, who is the head of the social policy division at UNICEF. Both have been engaged in uh, the discussion around the IMF strategy. And then my colleague, Justin Sandifer, uh, economist and fire starter. So that's, that's uh, I'll be the good guy and you can be the bad guy. No, it'll, be, it'll be fine. Um, so let's first turn to Hannah. Can you tell us a little bit about how you see, you know, uh, David's put a lot of emphasis and the IMF has put a lot of emphasis in this strategy on the mandate of the IMF, the scope and the boundaries. How does, uh, and yet there's also some new areas where the IMF is engaging. H how does the World Bank uh, role complement what the IMF is doing? How do you see the strategy interacting with what you, uh, what, what, what the bank has been doing historically? Thank you. So first of all, to say David actually has been now almost at home in the World Bank as he has been discussing the, the new strategy with different teams. And this is truly a very welcome opportunity to further strengthen uh, the, kind of the more holistic approach that is needed to uh, public expenditure prioritization and also management uh, in countries and turning public expenditure into, into results. Now, as, as David mentioned, there are some, the traditional approach has been that uh, you know, the fund is more looking at the overall macro fiscal picture, and, but helpfully also pushing the resource mobilization front on the tax side. And in the bank, uh, I think the approach has been very much looking into depth on, within the sectors and with strong emphasis on supporting governments in prioritizing within sectors. Uh, I think now with the human capital uh, initiative over the past years, the bank has uh, made an effort to promote the kind of whole of government approach uh, to accomplish objectives such as the human capital advancement, which in some countries may mean investing in early years uh, uh, 
uh, in education, in health. In other countries, it actually it may mean more in, in about investing into skills for jobs, investing in women, empowerment, and so on. And I think with the new strategy on fund side and the human capital approach on the bank side, there is truly an opportunity now to, can, to link better these three areas, the macro fiscal, the prioritization across sectors, and the prioritization within sectors. Now, what, what is important, and I think where, where we would like to work together more in the specific country context is how to introduce uh, more strongly the outcome orientation. Mm -hmm. Because not all social expenditure is contributing to uh, human uh, capital advancement or desirable objectives, right? Even in social protection, some social expenditure is more about uh, pensions that are inequitable in many countries uh, with very little left for, uh, for poor households in terms of basic safety nets. So how to introduce better outcome orientation in the prioritization within sectors as well as across sectors. Now, what is also important is not to forget about the uh, importance of non-social sectors, non-social expenditures for the well-being of, uh, of the people and for, for the human capital specifically. So when we think about um, Yemen, for example, right, it's a lot about investing in uh, clean water, uh, sanitation to prevent cholera outbreaks and so on. It's about giving cash to poor households so that they can purchase the food that actually is available, but the money is not available in households. So, so it's about it's not a, it's not so much about uh, kind of broad education, but it may be about some some elements that are actually not belonging to to social expenditure at all. Now, one one point that I would like to conclude on is that sometimes what is clear, like David mentioned, the examples of subsidy reform, mm -hmm. right, and create through subsidy reform, so by reducing the subsidies to energy prices, creating the, the fiscal space, having the resources to invest in better services uh, and better safety nets. Now, it has happened in a number of countries in South America, Indonesia, more, uh, and, and East Asia, and more, more recently in Middle East and North Africa. But it has not been easy. It has been actually very difficult. In many countries, it's still a reform that is yet to be completed. Mm -hmm. And the fact is that uh, attitudes in societies are shaped through different uh, influences. And uh, analysis of expenditure efficiency is not necessarily one of them. Right? So I think one, one challenge that we share and where, you know, and, and we have been discussing in the different country contexts where we work is how to actually how the, the World Bank, the IMF, and other players could uh, influence indirectly the, the debates within the country so that some of the reforms that benefit the majority, that benefit the poor, are in fact seen as desirable and are politically uh, feasible. Can I ask you, uh, one, one kind of, let's say a country has to undertake a program of a Adjustment. You know, obviously, the, the, there's the big, po difficult political reforms that one wishes countries would do, but that for various reasons, it's even harder for them to do it during a period of contraction. Um, would you see a kind of different approach of the bank IMF together uh, to discuss, you know, where are the opportunities to make efficiency? Or, like, what is do I, I sometimes feel like when the adjustment comes, it's kind of a surprise for everyone, and then they're scrambling around like, okay, well, what what works actually? What spending is really important? I'm not sure. Do you, you know, are we sort of taking a more strategic approach with the idea of this strategy and interacting in a more systematic way on those macro fiscal critical efficiency reforms? So, in, very recently, I've been involved in in two different countries in. Uh, I would say almost day-to-day -day intensive discussions, drawing on the evidence, on the analysis that mm -hmm. exists within the bank on you know, sector-specific, and then discussions with the fund and with government counterparts in terms of what, you know, how to reprioritize mm -hmm. and how perhaps through cuts in one area as well to move the money to you know, advance the, mm -hmm. uh, uh, the 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 kind of the, the programs that are most needed while perhaps reducing the overall um, mm -hmm. budget envelope. So, so there are good examples mm -hmm. where it has been happening, so it can happen. Mm -hmm. 
But of course, now the question is to, you know, how we make sure that perhaps this is happening in all the countries. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Alexandra, uh, obviously UNICEF has been a great uh, watchdog and champion of uh, social spending. You know, I think but, but UNICEF and the IMF together were more probably talked about in the 80s than they have been in recent years. So tell us how you've been engaged in this strategy and how you're thinking differently about your engagement going forward. Um, thanks, uh, thanks, Amanda. It's been a real pleasure engaging with uh, with the IMF on this, and also on the um, social safeguards uh, guidance that came out um, that came out before. I mean, you mentioned the '80s, and um, many people may have heard about the structural adjustment with the human face, which was um, a document put out, a book put out by by UNICEF years ago. It might have been 1990, um, which critiqued the, um, the Washington Consensus and the impact it was having on, on children. I think we've come really far mm -hmm. from those days. Um, I think that the IMF and the World Bank um, have taken a very different view um, now than um, what, they, what they did then. And we've also come a long way. So at that point, we in, in UNICEF, we didn't have a, um, this was, there was an advocacy agenda that we developed around this that was kind of new at the time because of the impact that we, um, that we saw. But we didn't have a well-developed area of work on social policy. UNICEF's work was on health, education, um, water and sanitation, child protection. Um, and we continue working in, um, in all of those areas. But since then, what we've, been able, uh, what we've been able to do as an organization is not just say, we need to hold other organizations to account, but actually we can act. We can be part of the, of the solution. And that's been happening, so we have a role to play in poverty reduction, the work that we started doing in social protection. We have a role to play in helping countries make better decisions about sustainably financing the different sectors um, in, in, which, uh, in which we work. We've gotten much more involved in public finance and looking at the efficiency and effectiveness of public expenditure, um, very often in collaboration um, with, the, with the World Bank. And you can hear it here in terms of what's, um, what's in the social spending strategy. I mean, the idea that inclusive growth, I, I don't know how far back that goes, um, David, that um, that inclusive growth was central to um, to what the IMF um, did, but I think we all understood it as simply macroeconomic stability years and years ago. Certainly at the start of my career, and now there's um, and now where the goal and the clear and stated goal for for the World Bank is poverty reduction. I think another thing that's really helped to bring us all um, closer together is the recognition of just how bad inequality is for macroeconomic stability and, and growth. Um, and the world's growing more and more polarized. Um, and that is having a negative effect and not a positive one um, on, on growth. So these are, these are all areas where um, there's some of the big picture items. The work that we're doing, um, and if, if I have a chance, I'll, I'll get to that, is, is rarely at that big picture level. It's much more at the retail level of each of these sectors. But it all contributes. Um, as, as David alluded, to making a difference in, um, in each of these sectors. Because you have to understand what's going to have an impact. What will be more, what is a more efficient um, way to finance, uh, not just to finance, what's the more efficient thing to spend on? And here I want to come back to something that, um, uh, that Hannah said that I, I really liked and has been really important to us and is one area that I think we'd like to see the IMF come along with us, which is looking at impact looking at the actual outcomes. It's one thing to look at how much money is spent in a, in a given area and whether you're decreasing it. It's quite another to say, are the immunization rates going up or down? Mm -hmm. Are children complete, not only completing school, are they learning or are they not? If we don't look to those end goals, then we won't actually be having a long-term impact on, um, on growth and development. OK, great. Okay, Justin, now you. Justin has a couple slides, colleagues. Um, so what were your impressions as you were looking over the strategy? Um, no, I, I, my impression was, um, and I, I read all the background papers, the case studies, the report, and really enjoyed, I think my takeaway would be, it's like those um, blind tests of Coke versus Pepsi. You know, I feel like, especially the latter half of David's presentation, 
if we did a blind test of is this Oxfam or the IMF talking, uh, I'm not sure we would necessarily, I would have been able to distinguish. Um, and I, I mean that in a good way. Uh, I know that we have a mixed audience here, but like the, the plea for, you know, there's a financing gap to achieve the SDGs of 16% of GDP in low income countries. Okay, you know, that's a, that sounds, you know, like my friends in, in global health and, and education advocacy. Um, and it feels like the IMF, I guess you're west of the World Bank, so the IMF has positioned itself to the left of the bank uh, in some ways there. Um, but I guess I'm, I was a little worried when in the presentation you noted it's not that this strategy is to say we need to scale up, this strategy is reflecting on the fact that we have engaged and scaled up in these sectors and now we need a more coherent strategy for how we do it. Well, if the scaling up has happened and we still need 16 percentage points of GDP, um, I'm kind of curious, like who is the audience? When we say we need to spend 16 percent more uh, of GDP, is that an audience to the res reps in the, in the country programs? Or is this a plea to US Treasury down the street and our friends in the EU that the, the RGT needs a lot more money? Like who, who are we talking to there? Um, I don't know if I need to go through this, but I, I appreciated, this is maybe a more nuanced point. Something I really liked about what you said is that you, this is in the report, and I think you just referenced it in passing, like all your analysis of like what has actually happened. This is changes in health spending as a share of GDP and education as a share of GDP under IMF programs. And the bars on average are a little bit in the positive territory, except here on education and the, and the GRA. Um, and I feel like there's a couple of ways of looking at that and what's in the background paper was a little different maybe than than what's in the policy document like uh, i think i literally remember taking international econ and you know for endogeneity bias people use the example of like you know you shouldn't blame fire trucks for fires even though they're correlated and you shouldn't blame the imf uh, for structural adjustment and spending cuts um like Okay, but you also, if you're the fire department, shouldn't say, we've done the regressions and we have no association with fire and thus that's victory. Like you'd like at the end of the day, the fire department showing up to lead to a reduction in fire and you'd like for the IMF showing up under the PRGT to lead to an increase in social spending if that's what the PRGT is supposed to be doing. And so I felt like the, the regressions we're all framed towards saying, look, don't be on our case. Even historically, the IMF has not led to a reduction in social spending as opposed to what would have happened anyway. There's you know, no blood on our hands. Um, which is worrying about you know, where are things going going forward. I really liked the way you put it in the presentation, which is to say, okay, those bars did have a lot of negative territory. If on average we're doing okay, there's lots of cases where where programs are still presiding over a real deterioration in spending. Okay, David, you've heard some perspectives from uh, our other three panelists. Um, what do you see as, what's the change in business as usual? Or is this, you know, you, you, as you said, we started with this idea that we we're already scaled up, we're just codifying it, we're just getting more consistent. But can, can, for a lay audience that's not as familiar with the programs, how, how is it changing business on the so day-to-day -day basis? So let's say what we talk about, I think, I think in the past what you've seen, and we're going good distant past now, would be this is not an issue for us. Mm -hmm. the, those days are well gone. In fact, the strategy in some sense is to double check we're not gone too far. You know, the IMF slash Oxfam might be the new institution that we have coming up <laughs> or whatever. But, so I, I think that's very important. And I, I, I'm one of the big proponents of social spending in the fund. But I'm also one of the big proponents to make sure the fund don't become the bank. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean we say go over and talk to the bank. And I think this is where the mistake was very often in the past. Go over, you know, uh, we go to give a technical assistance and we say, ah, that's the World Bank, you need to go and talk to them. I think we have to square the circle here. We have to link things up. And it has worked very well in some instances. So I'm a kind of half glass half full guy, I have to say. You have to be, I think, in this agenda. Mm -hmm. But I think I see huge, huge uh, progress in that area already. 
Yeah, possibly a bit narrowly focused on a few institutions, but I see huge progress in there. But I also see places where we can do a lot more, which is why I spend a lot of my time in the World Bank and talking to Andrew these days. You know, um, but you know, I wanted to come a bit, a bit back to the to the uh, Jason or Justin, 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 Justin. Justin. <laughs> I have a colleague Jason who I call Justin. Um, uh, so, you know, scale up in what the I. The Fiscal Affairs Department have been providing technical assistance on revenue and tax policy to revenue management for decades now. Yeah? There has been huge push, and every area department I know spend so much time trying to get policies that would scale up tax capacity. Reality check number one. Mm -hmm. Governments make policies. <laughs> so start focusing your attention a bit on governments. Yeah? Governments make policies, and they make good policies, and they make bad policies. We have a crucial role to inform them and to support them in terms of capacity development and to move the process along. But we can't do it for them. So what are these policies about scaling up? There are opportunities to scale up. Maybe, maybe not, and the 16%, forget about that in five years. Just forget about that yeah? in terms of tax capacity. Uh, but there are opportunities. And we, I'll try and drag it into a few of the questions that were here. But why don't we see them happen? Uh, it's good and well for us to work better in our institutions together, I think. But you know, we've got to make, we've been doing okay in yeah. all that. We can improve it. But it really has to happen at the country level. I'm just going to take the example of energy subsidy reform, because I've worked a lot on that and I've seen a lot more of that in the real world. Um, the amount of money you can get from energy subsidy is enormous. So this can be a big part. One instrument, not a capacity problem. This is not a capacity problem in terms of technical capacity, administrative capacity. It's just not. It can happen. Be careful while you read this last. It can happen tomorrow. Mm -hmm. It shouldn't happen tomorrow, but it can happen tomorrow. Yeah. Uh, energy subsidy reform. I'm going to not mention country names here. So energy <laughs> subsidy, subsidy reform. Yeah. is a situation where you offer, it's go back to the tax story I said, no one votes for a tax increase. Who would vote for or support a price increase in fuel? If you believe the money is going to be wasted, if you don't know why they're even, even if I bothered to explain to you, which I didn't bother to explain to you in the first place, why would you vote for it? Look at the way in which these reforms are done. Yeah, where they're done, they just happen. I think there's a real gap in support for countries to help them do the political economy of reform. And by political economy, I don't mean regressions that shows democracy is good for growth. And if it wasn't, maybe we shouldn't get rid of it anyhow. Yeah? But Let's it's not that. It. It's, not? Really, like it's really yeah. about yeah. the operational stuff, yeah. which says, have you got government talking to each other about these policies? Not the day before mm -hmm. they're doing the policy. And you really don't see a lot of it happening. I, I, I see so many instances where it doesn't happen. Have they built coalitions with mm -hmm. the public, with CSOs? And you just don't see it happening. And reforms get reversed and whatever. And I think that's a big gap. I don't see much support going on. I see lots of support for telling them how to raise tax policy. Mm -hmm. I don't see much support for political economy. I'll make it one link because I'll get a bit of a call out for the bank in this area. Um, the bank in the last, let's say, decade have really got their act together in the area of supporting energy subsidy reform. Energy subsidy reform is one of these big cross-cutting issues in the bank, for example. But they have this group now who do it. They have put together a group who actually talk about communication strategies around that. Mm -hmm. And there are groups out there beyond the bank. This one comes to mind, there are others, and I don't want to upset the others. Global Subsidies Initiative, which is part of something called IISD, and I've forgotten what an acronym stands for. But you know, there are, and I think we need to put a little bit of more support in that. And it can be completely arm's length from the fund and whatever, and preferably arm's length. Mm -hmm. In our own world, I got a communications person down here looking after me called Nico. Hi, Nico. <laughs> so Nico, we worked with very carefully a lot with on the strategy paper. And we emphasize in the paper the importance of communications. Now, within the fund, we have groups who have worked very closely with the teams 
on the communication strategy around broad macro fiscal. They don't tend to get into the details of the weeds. But I think someone has to go out there and put the whole of government approach together at a very minimum, mm -hmm. but preferably say. So I think where, where if, if all this, if we're giving all the support, where is it going? I think part of the reason it's not going anywhere as fast is because mm -hmm. we're not paying sufficient operational attention to this. So we've been trying to work recently with this group at the World Bank, and I think I can mention the country because I think the report is public. Uh, we went to Colombia, mm -hmm. and they were talking about generally energy sector reform or whatever, and they said, well, can you guys come in and help us? There's others helping us, but you can help us think about certain things. And so we talked about how you think about energy pricing and you know, how it maps to the fiscal and whatever, but we brought someone along to talk about communications, and we gave it a go. They were a bit hesitant at the beginning, but very quickly, as the discussion went into why did our VAT reforms fail, then we, they started. So we, we had a little foray into it. Fortunately, it was a success. If it was a disaster, I might have been set back a bit, mm -hmm. but it, it was a success. And we had a convened a meeting in the fund just to say, present that work to g see if there's a latent demand for this. And I believe there's a true latent demand within the fund, but I think mm -hmm. it's really out there. So I'd make a call out now, because I think it answers a lot of the questions you're posing. Mm -hmm. It's a reality check, governments make policies. You have to, we have to support them, not just in the technical capacity of tax policy and expenditure policy. They kind of know a lot of that. Mm -hmm. They still need support and to do this, but they need support putting together their reform packages and not just a document. I think we sometimes stop short at a document. Those who've been in this world longer than me will know the different names to the different types of development documents over the names. It would be interesting to put them all up. I think it's the support. And you know, maybe there's more of it going on than I know, but I don't see it. But I think it's a big gap. Alexandra, do you want to? You know, I think that it's an interesting point that advocacy and communications has been deployed on behalf of health spending or education spending. But actually, to enable more health and education spending, it's through these more difficult less easily sold macro fiscal reforms or subsidy reforms. That's uh, something to think about for those of us who work in the field. But do you want, do you want to comment on this, Hannah? Uh, oh, yeah, and, absolutely. And because it's, um, uh, for me, this is one of the most difficult questions when we are in country to actually think how to support the policymakers so that they can sell the reform, they can make the reform successful. And the subsidy reform is certainly one of the examples. But there are some, there was a communication advocacy is one thing, but developing something that works in a specific country context that actually resonates with the mm. people, it's sometimes very different, mm. right? Like in the past, uh, including this group you mentioned, uh, David, there was Jeez, a lot man. of, yeah, and the SMAP group, there was a lot of uh, emphasis on showing the evidence, which of course it's important. It's important to show how the energy subsidies are regressive and that it is the rich who benefit from most and that you know, for the poor and for the majority of the population actually it's better to use the resources differently. But it's different, you know, one example I give you recently, I was in Jordan, where we worked very closely with supporting the authorities in expanding cash transfers to poor households and uh, uh, developing a new approach with digital payments so that suddenly the, uh, the, the mothers the, didn't have to wait in post office days after days to receive their cash every mm -hmm. month, but they would have e-wallet. And so this was a pilot and when I saw it, they were like, they were beaming, they were just so happy having this cash coming under e-wallet. The trust, their trust in government increased significantly. With their trust rising, then the likelihood of reform succeeding is much higher. So I think this is just one example where the communication sometimes is most effective when it's kind of bottom up and when it kind of reflects on some of the good uh, pilots and good initiatives that the government can start before launching uh, you know, some, some painful, painful reform. Okay. Yeah, um, this, this story was making me um, think of the, my last duty station. I was in Moldova, where the, uh, where the schools, um, half the population, half the school population had declined. Um, and there was a real need, and people were very surprised to hear UNICEF agreeing with it. Sometimes our voice can be very helpful, because if we're going to agree with this kind of a reform, that, that kind of changes the picture. Mm -hmm. um, but. They, the, the education ministry needed to spend 
less, but they needed to close schools. Not because they needed to save money, and it was a little argument I have with the IMF representative at, um, at, at the time. Yes, we agreed that you needed to save education funds, but you needed to save them to invest in something else. So to invest in, in further education. There was no point in keeping a massive high school open with the heating on all year so that the building didn't you know, fall in on itself when there was nobody in it. You know, or there were 60 kids when there were supposed to be 500. Um, and so being, um, being part of that kind of dialogue comes really naturally to us because UNICEF is there accompanying the sector ministries. You know, we've been there for 20, 30, 40, 50 years in, in some cases. Um, helping our sector counterparts think through, well, how do we spend our money more efficiently? How do we get better results? Because the only thing that we're measuring as, as results in the country programs that we make together with the, the governments with whom we collaborate is, is the situation of children getting better. And so the money is a means to that end, um, but it's not, the, it's not the end itself. And if that means spending the money in a different way, then we can be part of and help them to make that case and to, to tell that, um, that story. An awful lot of these um, of the fuel subsidy reforms do end up then going, of course, to social protection. And that becomes part of the dialogue that these um, that countries have with their populations. Ghana is a pretty famous example. And I don't know um, the extent of the involvement of the IMF in the decision for, those, um, uh, for that reform. Mm. But both uh, UNICEF and the World Bank were involved in supporting the government in, in ensuring that those savings then went into social protection to, to have a, um, to ensure that, um, that those, that the poorest who were affected, because of course the subsidy reforms, I mean, maybe we should just say it to be clear. When you cut an energy subsidy, uh, when you cut a fuel subsidy reform, it impacts everybody. It impacts the rich more, because those subsidy reforms are regressive. Those subsidies, rather, are regressive. The rich use more fuel than, than the poor, and therefore it impacts them. But it also impacts on the poor. Mm -hmm. And so we've done things like uh, do those kinds of studies with government. Well, what is the impact going to be on the poor, and how do you mitigate it? And then that creates the, um, the demand for, um, for the input, um, for, for moving those funds into, um, into social protection. Um, so I, I think you know, for us, that the fact that communication is, is part of it, evidence and communication around it, um, that the political economy story is part of it is it's part of the bread and butter of what, um, what we work on all the time. And it's actually an area where we can probably come together um, quite often, as long as there's an understanding on, on the side of the other partners involved of the IFIs <coughs> that, yes, when you make those savings, they need to be invested back into human capital. Mm -hmm. um, then, then we're talking, and then we're collaborating. That sounds interesting. I think one of the, uh, uh, in your 16 percentage point slide, uh, so, you know, I think all of us, at least at CG, we've, lots of people have mentioned this, you know, it's, we should probably be more realistic in terms of what new money is going to be available over time. We expect mm -hmm. it to grow in the aggregate, but it's not at the level that is desired. It won't meet all needs, et cetera. And yet, there's a series of reforms that are out there. And I'm just going to be controversial. I'm not, uh, let's say, universal health coverage, universal secondary uh, policies that imply full subsidy for all parts of the income distribution for certain kinds of services. And we've kind of finessed what that means from a fiscal sustainability mm -hmm. standpoint, because we're like, no, we're going to get that big pot of money. OK, hopefully we get that big pot of money. Everyone gives 0 0.7, et cetera. Everything's great. But in the eventual scenario where we're you know, slow growth, investing at the margin, uh, do you have some thoughts on that issue, Justin? And then I'll turn it back to the other panel members. How does, how does that sort of expansive universalist agenda fit with what we know about the most likely scenario in terms of revenue growth? Um, OK, I'm going to try to squeeze that my answer into, I don't know if, Mike, we can get, I wanted to put David's conceptual framework back up there uh, to guide me with the, the Venn diagrams. Oh. Um, um, I mean, I feel like essentially what we have is like the makings of a, of a budget constraint here, right? I mean, we have fiscal sustainability and, and spending adequacy. We want 
adequacy. We're faced, you know, ultimately there's a budget constraint up here imposed by fiscal sustainability. Um, and maybe we can adjust efficiency to get to some of these outcomes um, that we want. Um, I guess one question I had, it relates to, to your question, is the, the rhetoric in the policy document is about the recognition of the importance of social spending, whether it's universal health care or universal secondary, for inclusive growth. Great. Um, is the IMF ready to say, and maybe this speaks more to your colleagues in other departments, that you believe in that channel to the point that increasing spending adequacy there changes your debt sustainability calculation or your fiscal sustainability calculation. You really think that we're going to invest in health and education and that has macroeconomic and fiscal implications, not just that that's something that UNICEF tells us is good and we should be, we should be doing. And I, I kind of heard the document wanting to go there, but maybe not quite going there. Um, the last thing sort of now jumping off you know, or tangent from your question, though. Um, I like something you said earlier, which is like you, the fund enters from the lens of fiscal sustainability usually. Um, and I mean, <laughs> as an aside, you can see where the case studies, these are the case studies in different, you know, these are three reasons why, why social spending can be <laughs> macro critical. You know, some of these things appear to be <laughs> stronger channels towards macro criticality than others. You know, nine out of 10 times spending efficiency is a worry. Nine out of 10 times fiscal sustainability is a worry. Five out of 10 times spending adequacy is, is a worry. I think it's a little less weight there, at least in these case studies. But you said something about maybe being a bit hands off on the spending efficiency side um, and deferring more you know, to Hannah and Alexandra and, and institutions down the road, which you know, for me, for the, the case studies, reading the case studies, was, it was welcome to hear you say that and to see the policy reflect that maybe a little bit. You know, the case studies talked about, I'll cite the Bolivian example, where the, you know, the fund helped recommend increasing user fees for healthcare and, you know, payment for performance systems for doctors and hospitals. I don't know if those are good things, but those feel like things that are way outside the mandate of, of the fund. Um, and I would almost be excited to hear sort of a sort of detente here in which the fund kind of says, actually, no, you know, we spending efficiency is important, but it's not something that we, you know, that is in our area of expertise that we can that we can speak to. So, uh, so first of all, Justin, <laughs> you're clearly the only person in the room, along with me, who's read the whole paper, <laughs> <laughs> because. But it's good reading. It's actually, it's it. not a paper, it's background papers. Yeah. And I do encourage you to read the background papers because they're often the most fun things to do as well. Mm -hmm. yeah? And I think we can build on a lot of that. Uh, so that's good. It's always good to know people, someone somewhere reads the lot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah? and, and you're picking up on the right things. I think exactly. Now, like in any document that's we're good at condensing documents in the fund, and we're good at tight writing, yeah? which means other stuff gets left out. I think we're beginning to learn a little bit from that in terms of maybe we need a little bit more expensive to explain ourselves a little bit more. But two things. Fiscal sustainability, a fiscally unsustainable world doesn't live for long. No point talking about it. No point talking about it because it's not going to be there for long. So I can't remember now, but I'm going to claim it was intentionally put up as the first part of the Venn diagram, because without that, you're going nowhere. Just like without growth, you're working on the margins. Mm -hmm. So they're given in my view. And a lot of the fund is about that. And if the fund dropped the ball on that, you should come after us big time. Mm -hmm. That's the main thing. And one of the biggest pushbacks we got internally was the idea, listen, we have a mandate, and we think we do it half well. Everyone doesn't think it, but we think we do it half well. We better not drop the ball here. And I think that's really key to keep here, because I think it's also linked to the second thing, which was, are you guys, and this is the way it would be said to us, are you guys just going to become the bank? Which is a great thing to become, I think, but <laughs> it's not what we should become. 
I'll take the word efficiency. We should never drop the ball. The word efficiency should never leave the conversation for many really good reasons. It is fiscal space, just like taxes. Mm -hmm. yeah? mm -hmm. Now, with, with fiscal efficiency, let's, where does the boundary stop, stop? So we come very top down. We will look at outcomes. We have to start with outcomes. This is the way we say it all the time. Mm -hmm. We have to start with outcomes and gaps. Yeah? Then we will look at things, but we come from a macro perspective. Then we look at, for example, if there are these gaps, is it because spending is inadequate and are inefficient? Which combination normally. But whichever one it is, the objective in the end is to improve the social outcomes by addressing both of those things. And we do a lot of work in this area, and this is how we enter dialogue with ministries of finance on social spending, and it's how we enter dialogue eventually and get our channels down into the, I'm talking about the Fiscal Affairs Department and the expenditure policy in particular, with the line ministries, because we end up having that role to play in between line ministries and ministries of finance. Now, where does it stop? It stops around the things you said are in the reports here. If those things are in an IMF report, it better be taken from a World Bank or UNICEF report. No fund person has the capacity to make those. Even our health economists that we bring in for the reasons of health don't dwell so much down, down there. So what that means <coughs> that we can say, listen, there's room here. We can put the issue of efficiency and adequacy on the table with the Ministry of Finance and with the line ministries. Mm -hmm and keep it on the table as part of the agenda. It belongs as part of fiscal sustainability discussions, which should go to a medium term. Yeah? So we don't get into that depth. It doesn't mean we can't read these guys' reports. So when the experts tell us a bit, I like to read it and I like to try and summarize and see if it's some basic principles. Yeah? But very deep prescriptions in a country-specific case, we should really either have a report or stay away from it. But it does put an onus on us that we don't just wash our hands at that point. The onus is that we end up having some sort of operational partnership on the ground with experts in these areas. Mm -hmm. And that's where I think we're trying to put in a lot of our work now. Uh, well, I've spent a big fraction of my life interacting with these great colleagues on the left to say, OK, how can we bring this down to the ground? Not DC uh, or in New York or in Geneva but down on the ground. And I think that's where we really have to make. And we've been talking about, I won't go into the detail because it gets a bit boring quite about kind of names of people and stuff. But I think that's, the, that's what matters in the end. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it has to, another thing is, it has to be institutionalized. It can't be in personal mm -hmm. relationships. Mm -hmm. It has to be institutionalized. Mm -hmm. can, can I just uh, follow and just uh, two points I would like to add is, uh, one is that um, I think one area where perhaps there could be scope for you now building on, on the strategy and, and developing further collaboration at country level is the, tech, the excellent technical assistance that the fund is providing governments to improve the budget scrutiny, the prioritization, the budget processes. And this assistance usually is focusing on ministries of finance, right, and which kind of to build their capacity. In my view, what would be highly effective is actually to help the ministries of health and education and social affairs and transport to be better aware of what kind of analysis they need to do, what kind of uh, evidence they need to bring to be effective in these broader budget prioritization exercises that governments are doing. And I see often it's really a challenge for a ministry of education to make a good case to Ministry of Finance why and, and how much uh, resources they need. So that's my first point. The second point, I would like, maybe I heard, um, uh, Justin, something uh, you didn't say, but I heard a little bit you put the emphasis on the universalism, right? Mm -hmm. and, and I feel there's, uh, it's sometimes a bit of a, uh, how to put it, not helpful rhetoric when it comes like, should something be universal or targeted? Mm -hmm. I think that's the direction you were mm -hmm. heading. And I, I, see, I feel like there is a broad alignment in terms of objectives, right? In the development world, everybody in the end wants better outcomes for, for the people. The question is, what is feasible, how to get there? And I just feel so much energy is sometimes wasted on, uh, on just arguing whether the cash transfers to be introduced uh, 
can be targeted or the other partners will work with the government only if it is universal. So I think be really helpful in also advancing this dialogue to kind of agree on something what can be called, sometimes it's called like progressive universalism. So we agree on the aspiration in the long term, but let's also agree how to get there and let's agree on getting there instead. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, thank you for, for raising that, um, Hannah. Actually, this is one area where I really want to acknowledge also how, how far the IMF has come, come along on this and, and quite explicitly in in the document, I have read the whole document, uh, not the okay. background papers. I apologize. Uh, not the background papers. I definitely count. haven't read count. the background papers. <laughs> um, but there is a really <coughs> excellent discussion of of exactly this this issue and understanding that there are, um, you know, yes, you have to make choices at some point, but there are many ways to make those choices, you know, and certain kinds of targeting, you know, may or may not work. The overall uni progressive universalism that Hannah's mentioned, I think we do have a consensus um, around that. Certainly within SPIACB, this uh, social um, protection um, board that we uh, that we have. I also want to acknowledge the game changer of the IMF coming out and saying adequacy matters. You know, that's that's yeah. different. Yeah. Saying you know that that actually there are countries that aren't spending enough, and and I know that you you said that David today like. You know, what well, we've been saying this all along. It doesn't quite feel that way. And to me, the strategy really helps in, in having that said, um, having that said out loud. I think this this question of these big universal approaches and, and how to fund them, I think we get into those discussions because we have been um, obviously we support universal health coverage and we've been looking recently having a discussion that David joined us in and quite a few colleagues from uh, from the bank um, on universal child grants just mm -hmm. to understand them not to say that's the one solution mm -hmm. um, but it became but it's it's clear that a lot of these universal approaches they don't necessarily cost more than non-universal approaches if you take taxation into account if you fund them in a, in in a way where you're clawing back part of um, Part of those costs through taxation, and back to the political economy arguments, they create um, they create a basis for um, for the whole society um, to to want them. Um, I for for UNICEF, one thing that that we think is really important to look at in all um, in all of the sectors, and and the, certainly the bank is already um, doing this, usually in a larger form, is equity. How, how much of the funding in a given sector is actually reaching the poorest population? Um, it's actually harder to get at than you'd think, but when, within education, it's an area that we've also done some work um, with, um, with the IMF. Um, and um, the bank's doing some excellent analysis and looking at, at overall um, fiscal equity, looking also at the effects of, um, uh, of taxation. So I think that that would be another area where we can take forward this um, this work um, together. Um, you know, in terms of how much into the weeds the IMF gets, um, mm -hmm. actually, I have, I have an example that I, I just love. And we've been working together in, in Malawi. But as I understand it, it's an IMF working paper on the impact of child marriage, the impact of child marriage on economic growth in Malawi. So <laughs> David's surprised, um, but but it's there. But you know what? I I don't mind that. I mean, they're doing that together. Does that fit into the bubbles? <laughs> <laughs> well, but it. Fiscal but the thing is, but the thing is, it does. You know, it it. There are so many different things which it has impact on. Which, I guess, maybe. Um, I mean, th that kind of of joint work of looking at the Article Four consultations, in that. You know, when you were saying whole of government approach, well, it's even more than whole of government, it's whole of society. Because there are things that are happening um, in countries which are well outside of what happens in government but that have a big impact mm -hmm. on, um, on economic well-being. Um, and and this, is, this is one of them. So these are, these are other areas where, you know, where we can work together. We can bring new and innovative ideas that will make a difference um, mm -hmm. overall for, for macroeconomic stability as well as child rights. Yeah. Let me, uh, I'm going to go to the audience now, but Justin raised a point that is important, which is, you know, when you're assessing fiscal sustainability with your models, what is the time horizon before these human capital investments produce some return for that mm -hmm. process? Is there a timing mismatch between the way that we model this versus when we see some of those returns? 
I know, Hannah, your group has done some thinking on this as well. Do you have a um, response on that? There's fiscal sustainability in the short run and the long run. Yeah. Uh, there's no tomorrow if you don't deal with fiscal sustainability today. But fiscal sustainability depends on many things. Mm -hmm. And I'm trying to keep some sort of a macro hat on here without making big mistakes. But financing, internal and external, is at the core of that. And turning that financing into growth. Mm -hmm. Again, you have to have growth. Without growth, there is no major development going on. But I think... Um, Financing is an issue, but we're touching it there. I didn't purposely didn't go into it in detail. Uh, that sustainability can be sustained with guaranteed financing. Yeah, and I hear you're kind of alluding implicitly, whether we know it or not, to external financing, I think, yeah. Mm. Uh, the question is, how does external financing map to medium long run plans? Uh, we are beginning to look at this just by chance it happens, but I think we're early stage. Medium long run plans for the SDGs. Uh, what has to happen for that financing to come and be turned into growth and whatever? Exactly. That's very much the long term agenda. But mm -hmm. to make the point that, because I think we always need a reality check, and I, I always say in the fact, we shouldn't shy away from saying this. Short term fiscal sustainability is key. If you keep jumping from unsustainable to unsustainable to unsustainable, there is no development going on. You're just hanging around down here. So let's not take our eye off there. And if the financing is there, and if it can be done in such a way that those who are giving the financing, and on the whole, the fund is not the big financer, remember that. Those who are doing the financing uh, can be confident that that money will turn into growth. Then they're going to persuade themselves their long-term trajectory is sustainable. Yeah? yeah. You, can, you can sustain the debt if you can guarantee yourself the growth. So there's a number of things going on yeah. there. Yeah? yeah, I mean, which is linked again to the efficiency mm. part, right? If your money doesn't turn in, your investment doesn't turn into improved outcomes or um, uh, productivity gains later, what are we doing? Okay, so now out to you, our uh, audience. We have a short period of time. Hello. I'm going to go to Nancy and then Danielle and the fellow in back. Please, yeah, please, yeah, please introduce yourself. I'm Nancy Bertzall. Thank you, Amanda. Uh, thank you very much, David. Uh, I can't help thinking the IMF has really come a long way, which several people have already said. I was thinking back to the Sustainable Development Goals and a report that David Goldsboro did for, for CGD. And I think what's important about your report, if I can just pass this on to you and to IMF colleagues, is now it will seep down into operations in a way that earlier work of this kind didn't. Now it has sort of the big mandate. So I had a question. I mean, wouldn't it be good if the, at the country level we could have from the IMF the kind of studies that give a demand to the donors and maybe a demand to the country leadership of the kind that says, if you're going to meet the S these SDGs, just say in health and education, given this amount of growth that we all expect from you in the next five years or 10 years, given that you fix your revenue side in ways that we're going to help you do, how much more has to come from outside? I mean, one of the things I remember about the Goldsberger study was that the IMF operational staff were between underestimating sometimes how much aid was coming in then. But I think now maybe we're overestimating. I mean, it, let's get to the bottom line here. There just isn't enough. I guess the other part of that that I'm keen on is, and pe many people at CGD have heard me say this many times, in the medium term, can we just expect poor countries to keep increasing consumption taxes in order to increase their revenue without undermining the whole setup because the poor are paying these indirect taxes. 
you know, and so I've been educated by Sanjeev here at CGD from the IMF. And, you know, you read all the time you can't get as much revenue from property taxes and inco personal income taxes. But in the long run, maybe you can, and maybe there needs to be a better balance. So I'd put that on the agenda for the IMF next. Otherwise, it just looks impossible, 16% increase in GDP. I guess that was more a comment, but you might have a So should a, the IMF a be comment asked, to my comment, yeah. David? Sorry. Okay, go ahead. Uh, thank you. I didn't realize I was had been chosen. Uh, sure. Nathan Copeland, uh, Oxfam. Mm -hmm. So uh, first, I have to say, just, <laughs> Justin well, gave welcome a welcome to the family. I have to say, <laughs> I have to say, Justin, yeah, he gave you a, ve a very nice compliment to the IMF. I'm not sure I agree with it, but uh, we, we do. Uh, I mean, the IMF has made a lot of progress, and we're very happy they've started to listen a lot more, not just to Oxfam, but a lot of organizations who have worked on this and worked together with the IMF to come to where we are today. Um, also, thanks for this presentation. I didn't get a chance to delve into the paper yet, so I really appreciate this, you know, glimpse, and I, I look forward to reading it. But just maybe some two questions to ask about maybe sort of the hows into the strategy, um, like spending efficiency. You know, I have lots of questions, you know, whether you need sex this area data to really understand the efficiency of spending. But the big questions I have is I didn't hear anything about debt and the pressure to meet debt payment obligations and how that encroaches on the fiscal space to meet spending, you know, targets and commitments. And you can look at lots of countries, there's lots of examples where the things are sort of interest payments and debt payments are skyrocketing and the space for spending on health, education, agriculture is shrinking. Uh, so that's one question about that in the strategy. And then the other question um, comes back to something Hannah was talking about, and I'm really happy you mentioned Jordan, because that's the country that was on my mind this entire conversation, because there's teachers in the streets right now asking for pay rise. There was a tax, um, tax protest last year. The IMF's engaged there. There's lots going on to think about in this context. But the one issue you mentioned is trust and how important that is. And David, you mentioned just very briefly in the, the overview here, something about this whole government and society approach. I wanted to ask you if you could say a little more about what society approach means and maybe get to this issue of trust and how that matters for the strategy. Mm -hmm. thanks. Okay, thanks, we'll take one more question from the other side of the room, Daniel. Hi, it's Daniel Kotler. Um, I'm surprised by the amount of harmony and agreement there seems to be. Uh, partly I'm, I'm wondering what is it? Um, well, my question is about, is there any downside on this amount of agreement? Especially uh, on, I'm trying to understand what are the, what is underpinning this agreement and when I saw the 16% slide, I thought the message, the initial message, or the message I would have expected from the IMF was, this is ridiculous. It obviously cannot be achieved. Mm -hmm. uh, but, the, but if I understand the way the strategy is describing it is, let's agree that a lot more needs to be achieved. Uh, and how much more can be achieved, I think that's, that's where the, agree, the area for agreement is. So let's work on the first 5%. And, uh, now, but the question, the, so the, the question I have is this new uh, agreement also on the need of political communication, mm. looking for the positive spin. Um, is there a downside? And, and let me give a couple of examples, OK? Uh, David, you, you suggest that instead of starting with a discussion about how do we get the VAT reform, let's start with what are the outcomes we want. Uh, but this, this, the discussion about the outcomes we want is going to be very difficult if we can't agree if we're talking about an additional 1% of GDP or an additional 5% of GDP. In the area of health, you know, this is there's two completely different worlds that open up. 
If there was an agreement of whether what we're talking about is a narrow benefit package, we might then agree on everything that follows. But if we don't, there's going to be so much disagreement just in the discussion of the benefit package and the institutional assembly be, uh, behind that, that we're never going to get to the point of discussing the addition of, of GDP. Mm -hmm. Second example, uh, you mentioned the private sector. Uh, and then I, th I don't think there there's been any more uh, mention about the private sector. Now, the problem is partly if you expect that the additional 16% of GDP will come through successfully increasing public revenues and expenditures, you don't really need to have a discussion about what it is that they will eventually add to the mix. Mm -hmm. If there was an agreement that only 5% is going to come from, from the per from the public sector, then I think you could open a much more broader and more detailed discussion about what role exactly you're expecting of the private sector. Thanks. Okay, thanks. Very good questions. Mm -hmm. Alexandra, since, uh, do you want to start? Sure. About this? And I'll come to you okay, time. yeah, because I'm, I'm only, I'm, I'm just going to stick to to Daniel Cutler's. I, thank you. I, I, I appreciated those, those mm -hmm. points. Um, there is much more harmony. That doesn't mean that there aren't tensions sometimes at country level, or even globally, but certainly at country level, and that those are healthy. And we, we work very effectively, I think, in UNICEF with the World Bank. Do we agree on absolutely every single thing? No. But those tensions and discussing out those tensions and putting the evidence out in front of one another then helps to lead to richer discussions and better, hopefully, joined up policy advice to government whenever we can. Because that certainly makes government's lives less, a bit, uh, a bit less um, complicated. Um, I think also, so there would be a downside on agreement of, of, the, of, of what you're seeing here as a consensus if it were quite as rosy as it looks up here. But it, it's almost. It's almost that rosy, and that is really positive and creates a positive energy. But I think that other energy is there, is there too. Um, Amanda had started asking me about the 80s and, and that role that UNICEF played. That role that we played then is really a role that Oxfam usually plays, continues to play. It's an extremely important role that they play. And we're such a much more operational agency. That's our, our focus. And it's better that we do what we can there. And that players like Oxfam also bring these discussions up, and that we can also have these kinds of discussions in, in, in a forum like, um, like this. The, the last thing I want to say was the private sector, because you're right. We didn't come back to that. And I want to say that this is a live discussion within UNICEF, too. There's a lot of um, how do we engage with and harness the private sector. And some of us probably lean a little more on the Oxfam side in this are saying, they could start with paying their taxes. <laughs> um, so there's a, there's a role there, which, which of course the IMF and the World Bank and others can support of ensuring that everyone are good corporate actors. And there are plenty of corporate actors who will also say that. So we agree, yes, we should look at PPPs. We should look at, at, um, at, their, at their role. But their, their role is certainly partly where profit is created, that that profit needs to go back into informing the social, uh, the social good. And perhaps that's something, maybe that's for a next discussion up there. Okay, we'll come back and do that <laughs> one later. Uh, Hannah? Uh, so I'll briefly reflect on Nathan's question regarding efficiency. You know, in a way, efficient, the efficiency dimension is extremely deep, right? Because when you think it's actually down to the level of quality of services that are being delivered, right? And what is influencing the quality? of services, and, and there are lots of instruments. The World Bank has the uh, service delivery indicators, right, looking at what actually is happening in classrooms, in schools, and in health clinics, and what is influencing quality, whether it's you know, on the level of inputs or the processes and so on. But then uh, the one dimension that is really tricky is the, the issue of incentives, right, of the providers, the teachers, and the capacity for themselves. So then you come to the issue of accountability. And here the 
trust is so critical. So when you when you look at analysis, it shows that uh, across countries, that citizens only if citizens trust in public institutions, they are willing to engage and engage in a constructive manner in the sense of seeking accountability as opposed to just giving bribes and finding the way for themselves. So the kind of constructive accountability only and the constructive citizen engagement only comes with trust. Right? So, so the trust dimension is really critical and how one can support and how one can work with government to really build citizen trust is actually a very interesting and, and a question which I think is kind of escaping attention and certainly would deserve, uh, deserve more work. Okay, uh, David, on these integrated national financing frameworks, is there an ask for aid that is? Um, first, I think I have to yeah. start this one. I think and Nancy. this is possibly literally the first time I have a question from the room. Is this the Nancy Birdsell room? Yes, this is the room. So it's literally a question from the room. And, mm -hmm. But I have to say it is a privilege to present this in this room. So I mean that. Um, I think you hit the nail on the head in terms of CP into operations. Uh, there was always the criticism in the fund, of the fund that you're doing nice papers. We were doing nice papers and stuff. You know? But it, where is it showing up in operations? This also holds of the inequality work that has been done recently. And I, I believe the inequality work has gone like exponential. Yeah? And we can start talking now about consolidating it and improving it. Yeah? Um, uh, I don't know where we got to the, the paper you said earlier, but that's yeah. interesting. <laughs> we can talk about it. Uh, it, it shows you we've got there, and now we need to look at it. Um, uh, but it's the seeping into operations that we really expect this and to institutionalize that beyond individuals. To me, we can't underestimate the importance. Sometimes these documents look like, oh, they're just another piece of paper. They play another role uh, beyond us. Um, so I think that's true. You're right, the 16% is huge. That's what the number is meant to tell us. Yeah, overwhelming. And I think if I just map it to the question here, I do truly believe it's not going to happen unless we talk about the political economy as well. And, don't, and I won't belabor that point, but I think you're not going to get there. You'll get somewhere there with that. I think that's a point you're mentioning here. Um, it, it, it's growth is essential, whatever, but none of these things will happen unless we kind of get rid of the stop, go, and move towards some sort of sustain. Really hard, I know, and there's a lot of people, a lot more qualified for me to talk about it. Um, reliance on consumption taxes, I think people are right. This is the engine of revenue in the short run. I don't think that ever should get translated into we give up on the others. The others have a role to play, especially as you develop income tax. We should never give up on income tax. I mean corporate income tax here. Just to give a call out, there will be a board paper coming out in the IMF very soon, specifically on corporate and international taxation. Um, uh, you know, I always like what I hear, what our guys say, but it's going to be put down in, in a document. Um, so I don't think we're ever giving up on that. Uh, you can deal with inequality. You can do a lot of with consumption and transfers, and you're going to be there for a long time. What is the issue with them? I don't want to get into the deep weeds here. Uh, regressive, uh, they're slightly aggressive, slightly progressive. That's not the issue. Of course, they're slightly progressive, slightly, but they're not usually one or the other. The issue is that if you have a policy which says do no harm and you have people who don't get protected from increases in consumption taxes, you're going to be doing some harm. That is the issue. It's coverage of the vulnerable at the bottom as opposed to, I don't think regressive, progressive, any meaning in that context. Yeah? But it does matter there. Even if it was progressive, it matters there. So. Uh, that's kind of on the consumption I think we have to do in the long run. Private sector, um, you know, I agree. Um, we're not talking about the private sector here, I presume, as an engine of growth. That's a done deal. Yeah, we all know that. It's really private sector in terms of financing for social spending. I think it, there has to be a serious conversation around it. Uh, I'll just put out something that I know we talk about a lot is PPPs need to be looked at very carefully from both sides of the equation. Mm. The fiscal risk inherent in a lot of the PPPs means that it eventually ends up being public financing. Mm. Yeah? Uh, that said, you know, the question is where can you design them, what capacity do you have designed them, and when do they work? I think that's an open question, and I'm hearing a lot of debate on that.
Okay, so we've reached the end of our time, but thank you so much to our panelists. We'll maybe we'll have you back in a year and see how things are going. Um, I do want to do a little ad. We have the World Bank IMF meetings coming up in about a week and a half's time, and we'll be doing a whole fantasia of events on efficiency, on debt, on um, domestic resource mobilization and its political economy. So I hope you'll join for some of that. But just thanks to everyone for joining, and we'll stay tuned. Thanks.